head over to miniaturemarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices like Voices in My Head. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. You're about to see my Allegro one minute overview and final thoughts. This is designed to see if this game warrants more of your time. If it does, just keep watching because then you'll see my full intro overview and final thoughts. However, if you don't want to be spoiled anything and you want to skip right to the full review, use the time index below in YouTube. Voices in My Head is a wacky game of internal conflict in the court of law where one player is the prosecutor trying to make sure more jurors think the defendant's guilty than innocent where everyone else has a hidden role trying to manipulate the jurors depending on what they secretly want to happen. Players are going to be trying to control different aspects of his brain that will allow him to manipulate what he says, what he does, which will influence what the jurors say. You'll be deploying your own tokens and pushing them and trying to destroy other players because you're adding up control for different areas of his brain. And depending on that area, you'll thematically be able to add different things like innocence or guilty of how specific jurors want things to go. Or sometimes they'll be face down influence tokens that you won't really know what they are, but sometimes you'll get to look at them. And all the while, the prosecutor who wants him guilty gets to see what's coming up and how things will be manipulated and they can help mess with things too. You'll also be getting powerful strategy cards that will give you a different focus of what to do and you'll allow to tip the tables on people that don't know it's coming. Voices in My Head is a unique theme in gameplay. It has asymmetric hidden roles and objectives with this cool. Uh, you get a slight bit of choose your own adventure with storytelling in there. Lots of intrigue. It's a sort of Chuck E. Cheese style deployment, pushing other people's things off the platforms. But in the end, the wind conditions were really hard to control. Even in a game that always lasts more than an hour, you don't have enough control. You don't get enough influence to change things over. The prosecutor feels a little bit more like a moderator than anything else because again you have the lack of control and the game felt quite uncompleted and undeveloped where great idea, great uniqueness, but in the end it didn't quite execute as much as I would like because in the end it was just too hard to control your final destiny. So it's a little too random there in my, my opinion. That's voices in my head. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today we're going to find ourselves in a courtroom where one of us will be a prosecutor trying to bring Guy the Defendant guilty verdict. But everyone else is also a hidden role, asymmetrically, trying to finagle the voices in the defendant's head, trying to make them say and do certain things to make sure that their objective is met. Today we take a look at Voices in My Head, a very different and unique game from Unexpected Games. Let me show you how it's played, I'll see you on the other side. In Voices in My Head, a guy is on trial, one player is a prosecutor, and they win if more jurors think Guy's guilty than innocent. All other players will have a hidden end game objective with a persona, like deception. They want to have two or more jurors say that they're innocent and one or more be quite undecided. And all sorts of different ways that the jurors need to be for different roles to secretly want the jurors to act in order to win. Now here's the board of the game, which is very interesting. It basically has the person Guy on the stand, that's the defendant. Uh, and then we have different parts of his brain that you're gonna be trying to control with area control. And this is a game, you know, a few rounds in. And at the top, there's a bunch of jurors there. Now over the course of the game, these jurors sometimes are gonna get secret influence on them. And that's gonna say that these jurors like different types, judgmental, logical, distracted, they're gonna want the defendant to either be innocent, guilty, or maybe undecided. Also over the course of the game, some players will be able to specifically put on known things, like, hey, these people want uh, them to be innocent, or maybe they want him to be guilty. And there can be multiple tokens and things can be stacking and things like that. And that's how different win conditions work, like the prosecutor wants more of these juror pairs to, to, to have them as guilty versus innocent. If so, at the end of the game, the prosecutor wins, but multiple people can win this game. And it's, I think it's even possible that no one can win. The game is played over two parts of the trial, essentially two halves of the game. Uh, the prosecutor has the shield behind them, and they have three cards that they can select from. And this tells them the different aspects of the uh, of his brain that's going to be possibly controlled this round, like motor skills or speech, observation, instinct. And those all correspond with the different spots and the different platforms of his brain, which are essentially little battles of area control. 
Now the prosecutor gets to read just the front of the card and see what, what's going to be happening and what might happen when somebody controls that. They get to select one of these, and let's say they selected this one. They would put this like this, and they would slide it underneath the card so all the other players get to see what two things are going to be affected this round, but they don't know what's going to happen to it, but the prosecutor does. So then in player order, each player is going to take one of their markers and they're going to deploy them. And for this round, we know the instinct is one of the two that's going to be able to do something. So let's say the blue player deploys it here. They'll take it here and you can't flick it. It has to be sort of a smooth motion. And this player is going to maybe try to get this one off. This is three in control. One, two. And maybe they try to do this. So they try. Ooh, they were trying to knock this player off because if they were able to do that, let's just say this player got knocked off, it's destroyed, it's gone. So you can see you can't always quite tell what's going to happen. Let's just say you got destroyed, but in that case, it really didn't. Uh, because if the round is now, this player has two of control, this player has one, that's the prosecutor, they never get control. This player would be able to do certain things. Each player in turn order is going to deploy one of their markers in any of the platforms in that way. And then once all players have done that, the, pro the prosecutor will read what happens, uh, the flavor text, like, hey, uh, uh, the psychology expert's on the stand. Look, he's doing it right now. He's talking to himself, trying to you know, make him guilty. The prosecutor can place one guilty token on the impulsive jurors. So we find the impulsive jurors, and the prosecutor gets to go like that. Remember, they want more such jurors to have more guilty than innocent. But now, whoever owns instinct, or whoever has the most control, which is what we were just showing, can take one of their own control markers from any region that's already out there and deploy it to a different region. Then they can discard one strategy card to draw a strategy card. Now, strategy cards are really powerful. They help you do really cool things. You start with some, but these, let me just show you what one would do, for example. Play after you deploy a control marker to the planning section. And if you have at least two control markers at planning, discard one innocent or guilty juror, uh, token from a juror. Or maybe there's this one, trust your instincts. After you deploy your control marker to instinct, take one of your destroyed control markers and deploy it face up to a region. So lots of ways to sort of, aha, do little tricks that, you know, strategies of the, gives you a little bit more focus on what you could possibly do. Now, once they've done that, they flip over the card, the, the, the prosecutor, they'll read the, 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 the text as to what really happened, and then and something else will happen. Motor skills. This was the other type that could have been uh, you know, manipulated this round. You can destroy one of your control markers at motor skills to draw four influence tokens, place one of them on the perceptive jurors, and one of them on a different juror, and discard the rest. So those influence tokens are face down. Again, they're either going to be guilty, innocent, or undecided, and they get to take four of those, look at all of them, place one on perceptive. Let's say they looked at it, they want this one to go here. Again, they stack like that, because certain things will allow you to look at stacks and rearrange stacks and do things like that. Uh, and one of them on a different juror, maybe they want to go like this to combat this maybe, and then these two would get discarded. And there's a spot for the discarded influence here, always face down. And as you can see, there's a ton of intrigue in this game. Now, this card would then uh, get discarded. A new one would sort of come out like this. All players would uh, you know, essentially get to possibly draw cards, like we just did, the, the, the prosecutor did that. And whoever is controlling planning gets a strategy card. For example, if the blue player is winning, they'd get the strategy card. You pass the first player marker, and then we do this again. You do this for four cards in the first section of the trial. There's another separate deck that's the second half of the trial that do also different, different new things. And at the end of that, which is essentially four more turns, eight turns in total, the game will end. And then players will flip over their rolls, and you, then you'll go through all the jurors, flipping over all the uh, influence tokens that were face down, and you'd see who won. And when flipping over the jurors, you do something like this. This is just undecided. Now you'd look at this. There's one of the uh, uh, you know, innocent and two of the guilty. You would take away the smallest uh, side. So there's one of these. And you'd also take away one of these, which leaves this left. These are known as destroyed or canceled, actually. And some of the roles, like this one, they needed five or more of the guilty uh, tokens to be canceled during the end of the trial. Like I just showed you, one of those need, five of those need to be canceled. So they need a lot of things to try to be as even as possible uh, to make sure that things are being canceled everywhere, which again is really hard to do. Uh, but you look at all these rules, like this one needs two or more jurors to be undecided and they need to control or tide one of those two, the uh, planning or the motor skills. This one needs three or more jurors to say they're guilty and have the most destroyed tokens up there. So they got to get in everyone's way to make sure that they're the one that's uh, getting pushed out. Again, pretty hard to do. Uh, domination, two or more undecided, and control the tide of either of these two types. 
two or more jurors saying innocent or the fewest of yours destroyed. You don't want to be pushed off of platform, so you almost want to be losing those for the whole game. Different ways and different strategies. You can have multiple players win, and it's even possible that nobody will win if you're playing with a three-player game. When I first heard and read about this game, I thought, wow, this is really different and unique, and it plays out that way too. So uh, one thing that is, you could definitely say for this, I, you know, as I was playing this game, one of the first things I said is, you know, I'm sick and tired of playing the same games over and over, but they're different. Meaning there's no freshness, there's no uniqueness. It's just, let's just regurgitate a bunch of mechanisms, throw them in a box, paste the theme on, and let's see how it works. This is so different. It was a breath of fresh air in that regard, that it was a unique theme and different gameplay for sure. There's no game like this whatsoever anywhere, I don't think, at least that I've ever played. Uh, I like that you have asymmetric hidden objectives. Of course, the prosecutor, everyone knows they're, what they're trying to do is just get, get more jurors saying they're guilty, but everyone else's role is hidden and it's very asymmetrical as to what they're trying to do. They all have different things going on. And I like that aspect of hidden roles and trying to do your own thing and you're all sort of like at wits with each other, but some of you might be kind of working together and you might not know it in certain ways. Uh, it has a slight bit of that sort of choose your own adventure style with some of the cards where something, if you control a certain area, they say, hey, this is what guy said. Uh, do you, you know, he's clicking the pen, clicking the pen, and you know, what do you want to do? They tell you to stop. What do you do? Do you stop or do you just keep clicking or whatever? But a lot of the times when you're doing this and you're choosing these, you can kind of just get a feel for what might happen if you do one thing or another. And knowing your goal and knowing whether you want them to be more innocent, more guilty, or maybe some other goal, you can kind of a little bit play into what you think that that might do. And that was an interesting aspect of the game. Now, not all the cards have those on them, but some, a decent amount of them do. Uh, there is a lot of hidden information in this game and a lot of intrigue. I like intrigue in games, and this definitely had that aspect of it. And it definitely had the unique thing of that sort of like, Chuck E. Cheese, you know, you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you put the token in and you're hoping it slides over and hits the token and more tokens fall out and you get more. Of course, it never works out that way. Uh, but this had that sort of, I call it Chuck E. Cheese style deployment where you're putting the thing in. It's like a dexterity game where you're trying to slide your token on and push other people off. Just unique. You know, this was in uh, a game a while ago. I think it was kind of like Via Appia where you were trying to get goods and you're pushing things down and things are falling off. And to see it used in an area control game I hadn't seen before, but very unique here. Uh, so overall, those are the things I liked about the game. There were a handful of things I didn't enjoy about the game. The biggest problem I had with the game was, again, the end of the game, you're either going to win or not with your win conditions. You don't know what most everyone's are except the prosecution. And the win conditions themselves, they're really hard to control. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. You can try to control things and get your goal the way that things are, but quite honestly, it really comes down to which roles were randomly given out. Now, there is a way where you just randomly give them out. There's certain player counts that, of ones that you can use, but then after your first game, I highly recommend you use a specific kind where there's a couple of, there's a few different types of roles and you split those up into their types piles and you shuffle each type up separately and then you sort of deal them out depending on how many players there are, which one, how many of each you deal out. And that helps, but still you can find yourself in a game where like people, just the way that they overlap doesn't really jive because you don't know a lot of what other people are doing and sometimes you might be able to look at something and you gotta remember, okay, well, who did that? What are they doing? Are they on my team or not? I'm not gonna try to do that. But even if you do sort of figure out maybe what one other player is doing, this, this person's definitely not doing what I want them to do. This one definitely is. There's still only so much you can do because of all the players and the way that things are going, the things that the prosecutor does and certain things feel kind of random and you don't really know what the ramifications of what you're, what you're even doing or what, what's gonna happen if you do things. I just felt the win conditions are just too hard to control and the game is more than an hour long. Um, even with the smallest player count, it's gonna take about an hour, a little bit over. And to have a game that's that long, to have it come down to like, I don't know, it was a crapshoot. I don't know if I was gonna win. I tried my best, but I, I don't know. It just felt like there wasn't enough control in the game. Even though I liked the intrigue, it felt like there just wasn't enough levers to pull to actually try to make your goals. Um, you don't get to influence enough. Like it's like every every round, like, oh, two things happen. If, you, if, you're, if you're, you know, uh, if you're controlling this, this is going to happen. If you're controlling this, this is going to happen. And over the course of the game, you'll get to do a few things here and there. But again, a lot of what you do might be un un uh, undone later. Um, a lot of what you do might not even give you what you do. Hey, draw two of these, these influences, look at them secretly, put one down. Neither of those help me. 
what, what are you gonna do? I finally get to do something and it doesn't even help me. So that, that didn't, that didn't uh, do well for me either. The prosecutor, sure there's some strategy there. Um, you can try to figure out what other players are doing. You could be like, oh, they're, they, they've now answered one of those choose your adventure questions twice and both times they got to do something like in an innocent way. So maybe they knew that that's what we're gonna do and because they're pushing for innocence, maybe they are really trying to push for innocence. So I'll probably, when it's, if it's my turn to break the ties, I'll, I'll, I'll break it not in their favor. Uh, maybe I can try to push one of theirs off, but really, again, you still don't have a whole lot of control. And the prosecutor still really felt more like a moderator than anything. Um, the game to me, as genius as it is from like a, let's try to make something very unique and very different, they succeeded at that. But the game to me just felt sort of uncompleted, undone, undeveloped enough where I think the seed of here is something very interesting. And it's one of those games where it really sounded way cooler than it actually played out and was executed, unfortunately, because there's a lot, there's a lot of good here, but unfortunately I can't recommend the game because of you play a game for an hour, you don't have a lot of control. Let's flip over the things and see who won. Oh, none of us. Oh, okay. Um, so it's, uh, it, it was just an odd experience. Um, not one I could recommend, but kudos for stepping out there and making something so fresh and unique. Game Toppers not only transforms your existing table to a high quality gaming solution, they now offer full leg kits and dining cover solutions for the full table application. Paired with their amazing thematic premium stitch edge mats from noted board game artists like Vincent Dutre, collapsible cup holders, and really cool accessories, it's a complete system that upgrades every game you play. Go to GameToppersLLC.com or click the link below.